Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have Martin Resetuyo on the line, and he's a founder and lawyer at the law offices of Martin Restituyo. Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adam. Really appreciate it. All right. So uh, I'm excited to get into today's topic. So we'll be talking about, um, of course, we'll talk about your practice and your firm, but we're also going to talk about, you know, one of the focuses that you've, that you've made and an effort that you've made to really support the Latino community. And uh, I think it's interesting, obvious that, you know, you help many different communities and many different people at your firm, but um, we're going to get a little bit deeper today into that, that community specifically, and maybe some of the things that are, that are lacking, maybe some opportunity areas and and also some, you know, some solutions. So I think we're going to have a great interview and discussion today. But to get us kicked off, we'll start this interview the way we start them all with our Mission Matters Minute. So, Martin, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives and experts. That's our mission. Martin, what mission matters to you? Uh, Adam, thank you for having me on. Uh, the mission that matters to me most is empowering a Latino community, um, creating better role models for our children, immigrant, children of immigrants, and children like me. You are one of the very things that wakes me up in the morning and I'm passionate about, and hopefully I am here to help build and create other people like you in the future. Awesome. What a, well, I'm humbled and thank you for that uh, and, uh, and excited to get into the topic. And I love bringing, because I love bringing mission-based entrepreneurs and executives and experts on the line just to share what they do, like, and why they do it. Like, how are they making a difference? Like, how are they adding value to the world and the marketplace? So awesome stuff there. Um, let's just start from the beginning. So like, what interested you originally and how'd you go, how, what got you on this law track? Like, how'd that all begin? Well, it was simple. Um, I'm a first generation immigrant. I didn't have uh, a choice to get to the to get to the United States. Uh, my parents brought me over from the Dominican Republic. And um, when I got here, there weren't many uh, Latinos where I was. They just put me in an environment where there wasn't a choice. At the same time, my mother explained to me that I had to choose a career that I could say in one word. So that was basically lawyer, engineer or doctor, right? Yeah. And so I had to choose uh, between any of those. Uh, luckily, I wasn't uh, the dumbest kid in the class. And so I graduated high school, uh, 16, and then college, and then MBA, and then JD, and wow. then MBA. And then I, um, I went to work for what I thought was my dream at the time, which was uh, a big securities litigation firm in New York mm -hmm. City. Um, I got there. I put in a fair amount of time. But um, I was the only Latino guy there. Mm -hmm. And in, none of my colleagues were Latino, and I didn't represent any Latino people. Mm -hmm. And so it was a weird dichotomy, which I learned you know, to deal with, which is code switching, right? You live part of your time in one world while you still have another part of your, of your life. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, to put a baseball analogy out there, it's like asking a switch hitter to only bat left or to only yeah. bat right. Right? You go to work, but half of your life is sort of missing. And so after a few years of that, um, I also realized I really wasn't making a difference to the people I wanted to make a difference to. Yeah. Um, and so eventually, with some coaxing from some friends, I opened up this firm. Mm -hmm. The sad thing is there are no other significant Latino law firms in the United States. Otherwise... Mm -hmm. I would have happily, you know, gone and worked for one of them. But yeah. seeing as how this space was vacant, I decided, hey, if somebody's got to do something about it. It should be yeah. me. Yeah, I think it, I think it's very interesting. And, and of course, um, if I didn't get a baseball analogy out of you, I was going to question. I was going to be like, are you sure? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> love, love that you brought out the baseball analogy early and um, it makes sense to me. Um, but if there's some there's some people watching this right now, Latino community or otherwise, um, that are thinking about going maybe on the law track or they're thinking about like what that career looks like. I feel like nowadays and I, I was thinking about this as I was prepping for this interview. I feel like nowadays 
um, you know, the, you know, the, the influencer or the person that's on Instagram, all these other things, they get all these, all this other like traction and, and it gets all the media attention. And I'm like, yeah, but like so those single word professions, like you mentioned, so lawyer, like all these other things that we need um, are, are still really like amazing career options and paths. And they, they, they really build, in my opinion, the fabric of society. Like we need lawyers, we need all these other professions. What would you tell to some of the younger people that are watching this that are maybe considering a, a career in law or maybe haven't quite considered it and they're thinking about, you know, maybe that's interesting. Like what kind of things would you tell them? I would tell them this. Um, we found out in the pandemic one very important thing, which is that lawyers aren't essential. And because um, everybody else got to go to work and, you know, we were told stay home. Yeah. And that's OK. Um, because we do something that's very more, you know, that's just as important, or actually I would say, or say more important, we actually yeah. help build up people. And so I think if you're looking for the limelight, it's tough to do that as a lawyer, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, our mandate is our clients come first. Yeah. Um, if you're looking for service and you don't want to get shot at in the police force or something or go into yeah. burning homes, yeah. then, you know, this is a great line of service mm -hmm. where you can choose to bring uh, education and light to people. Because what happens is, you know, a lot of people function in this sort of semi-ignorant world mm -hmm. and they get into trouble just because half the time they don't know what's happening. And yeah. so, People call us in and then luckily, hopefully, if we're any good, we can yeah. put their best interests in front of ours and also show them how to escape or improve their problem. So I know a major part of your focus is really working with um, with so in supporting business owners in the Latino community. So like first off, maybe um, paint a little bit of a picture of what you see happen in the community overall and, and, and what you've seen as an opportunity. Yeah. So I don't. Look, all business owners, all yeah. business owners across the U.S. have uh, anywhere. They, they are a class onto themselves. For sure. They take on risks that most people don't take. They mm -hmm. then get themselves in problem. If you're a good business owner, you're in over your head 90% of the time. And then you <laughs> have to figure out the solution somewhere along the way. Now, the reason why I focused on Latinos is because while many people who are born into and have certain connections within this system, yeah. you know, have somebody to fall back on. There's this group of people and I'm not, you know, I can only speak to the Latino community because I'm an immigrant from that community. Yeah. What it happens to immigrants and Latinos and, and other immigrant groups, et cetera, is that you come to this place and all of a sudden you are the guy who left your country didn't speak the language to end up. You are now an entrepreneur. You are now trying to make things happen in this country. And guess what? Just like when I was told, go be a lawyer, but I didn't have any role models. You mm -hmm. know that you have these expectations, but nowhere to go for guidance. Yeah. And so this community, I think, like most business owners as a whole, mm -hmm. but then they get into trouble because they also have different cultural norms and they come from different places. And now things don't work here the way they used to work, yeah. right? And so now, you know, that was okay where I was from, and now I'm here, why isn't it okay here, right? Yeah. And so because of that paradigm shift, right, I decided that I'm going to try to build, put my energies into yeah. sort of helping them out. There's also another important reason, um, and this goes back to the role model uh, mm -hmm. question, and it's this. Um, look, business owners as a whole, have a disparate impact on society. Because for every one of them you help, they have four, five, 10, 25, 30 employees, right? Yeah. So by helping somebody like that, if my goal is to help you know, create these role models, I'm actually exponentially affecting the outcome of the improvement in this community. Because by helping one, there is a direct and trickle down effect to the other people who are seeing them as role models, who are also getting influenced by them culturally, economically, and otherwise. So that's why I focus on the Latino community, the Latino business owners in particular. Yeah. I, um, as, as you're talking, and, and I've thought about this often, is 
it's hard enough to be an entrepreneur in general. <laughs> like I, I have entrepreneurs on this show every day. And when, and, and like adding the complexity of language, maybe not knowing the systems, maybe not understanding maybe some co cultural norms um, that, uh, that apply in business um, here versus other places, regardless of where somebody's from. Like that's a difficult plight. Um, so I feel like a lot, a big part of this is the education piece and, and getting acclimated, but also like just the access to information. Can you talk about like information and resources and like why it's so important for the, for these business owners to have um, a great team that surrounds them to make sure that, you know, when things go, either when things go wrong, um, that they're taken care of, but even when things go right, they're taken care of because both can, can cause um, problems. Right. So the thing is, I mean, imagine being in a place where you're trying to get ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. You've made the sacrifice. Not only do you not know anyone, but at the same time and at some level, you feel like the system is against you. Right. Yeah. And so in many respects, you now have to rely on people you don't trust or you don't feel like you trust or you don't feel like they have your best interest in mind yeah. in order to help you get ahead. So, mm -hmm. look, I speak. Uh, Spanish. I culturally understand this and I've been through that path. Yeah. So what happens is in many respects, sometimes I'm sure there's well-meaning people out there that want to help, but they don't convey the message in a way that gets through. And so what happens is you have also, I have clients, look, I have one poor client who worked seven years of his life straight, seven days a week to save enough money to buy a restaurant. Then he opens up a restaurant, made 55 mistakes that somebody, anybody who we spoke to would have said, hey, <laughs> relax, you know, don't throw seven years down the, down the toilet, right? Wow. The guy worked 18 years, was now in a situation where without taking a vacation or anything, his, his first vacation in 18 years was to see his dying grandfather. Ah. Getting into problems for the same thing, simply because he doesn't trust anybody enough to say, hey, you know, this is how one proceeds. Yeah. And so, you know, that's that's where the dichotomy of, you know, you want to get ahead, but you don't really trust and you don't really know. And so that is a recipe for disaster. And so I'm hoping that I can be that bridge of yeah. look, trust me enough because I know what the other side of the fence looks like and I can help you get there. And you're also a business owner, meaning so you there's right. I feel like that that un, in itself lends to being able to kind of talk from different points of view, even just being as a business owner. Right. Yeah. I mean, in fairness, that business owner thing wasn't ever my desire. <laughs> um, I bet I went into a securities firm to, you know, I was in, I was enamored by that Wall Street thing. Yeah. And so I did. I represented shareholders on Wall Street, et cetera. Yeah. But when I looked around. There's nobody that looked like me, had my background, you know, spoke like me, was there. Yeah. And so that was a bit disheartening because mm -hmm. I think you and I have spoken about this before. Yeah. Look, Latinos have been here in the United States for about 200 years, right? Mm -hmm. Give or take, do the math, you know, Texas, California, yeah. Florida, whatever, right? And yet we keep on, you know, having the same problems, and so we keep on making the same, falling into the same pitfalls. Mm -hmm. And at this point, we need bigger problems. We need better problems. We need Wall Street problems. So my question, you know, when my clients come to my, to my office, it's like, you know, they come with a million dollar problem, for example. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, you should be grateful. Because, you know, five years ago, when you didn't have a penny to your name, you didn't have yeah. a million dollars to have a problem. Right yeah. now you have a million dollar problem. We're going to fall up. We're going to help you fall up. We're going to fix a million dollar problem. And hopefully I'll see you when you have a decamillion problem or a hundred yeah. million problem. That's my goal because that's where we should be evolving to. Problems don't go away. We just need to grow to have better problems. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And um, so looking at, you know, and there's there'll be some people that are watching this that maybe they're 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 over here and they're they're getting started in their career as I should say here in, in the United States and maybe they had successful businesses in other countries now they come over and they're getting acclimated and not saying that um because I don't want to oversimplify this meaning um I know that there's not like one piece of advice that generally fits everyone. But I do want to give them maybe some some themes or some things that they should be thinking about 
um, as they get acclimated, as they're doing things here. So I don't mean like specific documents, things like that, or, or set up an LLC. I don't mean stuff like that, but I mean like themes, like what should be on their mind as they, as they come over and they're starting a business. Um, and like, what should be some things that they're thinking about? I think one of the things that they need to think about is, you know, the United States is a funny place um, because for all that we talk about, it's significantly for all the, the, the news that you hear, yeah. it's a pretty organized place. Mm -hmm. And so there are rules um, at the local level, at the city level, at the state level, at the federal level mm -hmm. that that people have to follow. Now, I can't speak of the rest of the world, though I've done a fair amount of traveling. The reality <laughs> is being from the Caribbean and yeah. seeing Latin America, it doesn't function that way. There are rules on paper sure. and then there are rules in practice. Mm -hmm. Here in the U.S. at least, those tend to be coherent. Yeah. Um, and sometimes as a cultural norm, you come from places where, yeah, that's what's supposed to happen. Yeah. Um, but here's how we do business. And rarely do you have anybody knocking on your door and saying, well, you didn't comply. But here yeah. you do have that tendency of, hey, you're not complying. And yeah. then all of a sudden it's like, what do you mean I'm in trouble? This is how everybody does business. Yeah. yeah but that's not what the law says. And yeah. so my, my advice, my one bit of advice is that mm -hmm. people are people, but mm -hmm. the systems are different. Yeah. And so you can predict what people will do, but the laws um, and that the, the environment in which those laws function, they don't, they didn't, they didn't make the trip with you. Right. Yeah. And by the way, say, I'm saying make the trip with you. I represent second and third generation, yeah. you know, Americans mm -hmm. who just learn bad habits from their parents. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, That's you get thing. away with somebody for so long, you get away with something for so long Mm -hmm. That, you know, sometimes it's like you're representing somebody and it's the second generation, third generation. But my family's always done it this way. Yeah. It's always been wrong. It's just yeah. that somebody did not come knocking on your door until, you know, yesterday or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the issue. Yeah. Well said. Well said. So misinformation can be can be um, passed down um, from generation to generation. So um, that, that's, I mean, a good point. Um, I want to switch gears a bit here, Martin. So let's go. You, you mentioned some of the things that you do kind of broadly, but I like to be a little bit more direct. So tell us a little bit more about your firm and exactly some of the um, practice and areas that, that you handle. Yeah. So first, I, fo I do a lot of labor law. Um, and I do a lot of labor law, one, because a fair amount of my clients get in trouble with that. But second, because, like I said, you fix the employer, you fix everyone down the line. Yeah. And this isn't about, you know, hey, we try to, you know, obviously I want to do right by my client, but I also want to do right by his, you know, business. And yeah. so we make sure that we try to make it a sustainable business. And to that, we, you know, I do a fair amount of labor law. I do yeah. commercial litigation, generally, you know, business to business disputes, partnerships disputes, and even labor law. You know, I'm in federal court and state court all the time. Contracts. Um, and really paperwork, people do not value enough mm -hmm. um, putting things on paper. Partners yeah. putting things on paper, um, <laughs> employers with general contractors putting things on paper, purchasing yeah. businesses and putting them on paper. Mm -hmm. And I don't really, I've, I've counseled this more often now during the pandemic. Yeah. Estates, like thinking about, you know, what are you going to do with all this hard earned you know, assets, all these stuff that you've earned over the years, how are you going to pass that on? And that should be put on paper. Yeah. Um, so in my last uh, general bucket of business is uh, general representation, U.S. representation. So I represent, um, I'm general counsel to a number of companies from yeah. Caribbean and, and Latin America that want to uh, make their way into the U.S. market. Mm -hmm. And I help them navigate that. Again, it's legal. It's mm -hmm. also cultural, right? And so those two things go hand in hand. We're, you know, lawyers are really sort of like social scientists. You know, yeah, there's a black and white letter of the law, but, but until people get it from a cultural perspective, it's yeah. very difficult. 
I want to uh, focus on one of the ones that you mentioned a little bit further. So the idea of contracts, especially because when you think about some cultural norms, like the, the handshake deal or the like the trust or the family name or all these things that might work in other countries um, and they might they might you know be cultural <laughs> norm, depending where people are from. But um, but the idea of having contracts with everyone and the importance of that um, to not get yourself in trouble and to make sure that people, you know, vendors, other things like that, um, uh, keep up their end of the bargain. Can you talk a little bit more about just what you've seen in your career um, related to that? Yeah, sure. As a look, this goes back to a cultural norm. There are people yeah. who, who, are, who give you their word and their word means bonds, right? Take that to the bank. But that's because they come from systems where if they tried to take you to court, they wouldn't get anywhere anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's a handshake out of necessity. Yeah. Um, in the U.S., though, obviously, um, putting aside that, yes, you know, good business practices are that if you give your word, you gave your word. But you also put things down on paper because mm -hmm. what happens is um, you're planning out for the future. Yeah. Right. And so I do a lot of business ship, business partnership agreements. Right. Yeah. And then one of those conversations is. Uh, you know, I, the, it inevitably, I'm never going to have a problem with my partner. Yeah. Okay. I believe that we're yeah. always going to be able to get along. Okay. I believe that what happens if that person dies, yeah. do you like his wife? Yeah. How about his children? Yeah. Do you think they like you? Yeah. What do you think they're interested in you or your business or your money? And so mm -hmm. that once you put it in that context, um, then, then all of a sudden people say, Oh, wait, let me look at this problem differently, mm -hmm. right? This isn't my family versus their family. We're, you know, we're not back where I was from. We're yeah. here and there's a legal context, right? And also as far as contractors with, with outside vendors, mm -hmm. look, I have, you know, I, I say this to my mom regularly. I firmly believe that whenever people get out of bed and leave their house in the morning, mm -hmm. they have the best intentions in the yeah. world. <laughs> However, by the time they get back home at night, they haven't necessarily acted upon those best intentions. Yeah. And that's just a matter of needs, right? If you have a contractor who has a problem, who depends on somebody, mm -hmm. if they have a bigger order than your order and somehow they decide to breach your order, whatever, then, you know, word of mouth and, oh, I trust yeah. you, that's not going to carry the day. You yeah. And then luckily in the U.S., we have a system that provides damages, right? Yeah. Again, a a cultural difference from some of the systems not in the U.S., where in theory you have damages, but in practice, good luck going to court, right? Yeah. And so, you know, that's that's why the, the norms matter, but also, you know, mm -hmm. the putting it down on paper. And a final aspect, and I apologize for this, it's, it's trusting that the person who's putting it down on paper yeah. – you're trusting that they're that they have your best interests in mind. So a lot of times what happens is people, even if they're inclined, even if I've convinced them up to here, mm -hmm. I don't read English. I don't know law. Yeah. I don't know. And so I don't trust that you, the person who I'm paying to represent me, is mm -hmm. actually going to put my intentions down on paper. Mm. And that is a, another final hurdle, right? Yeah. Um, lawyers, we get a bad name. And that's it. Part of it is is lack of trust, lack of trust in the individual, lack of trust in the process. Yeah. Yeah. And so one other piece that you mentioned here that I want you to elaborate on a little bit more is the idea of a state and the importance of that and that there are laws and, and the and I guess you know, not to play the horror story side of it, but, you know, in my past career prior to doing this, I've been doing this, you know, five years or so full time in media. But before that, I was in I was a financial advisor and in the financial services arena for, you know, almost 14 years. So that being said, I know what happens when somebody doesn't have a proper estate plan in place. And I know how much uh, Uncle Sam gets right. Um, talk a little bit more about that and like the importance of having that estate plan, not just for the for the standpoint of what you mentioned uh, in terms of, um, you know, what's going to happen to the business and the other parties, but just the amount of money that you can lose just in the estate process in general. Adam, it runs the spectrum and I'm glad you bring that up. Um, the more I'm in this field, the more I've seen it from a per first hand view. First of all, when people don't have anything. 
Yeah. They don't care, right? And then all of a sudden they start accumulating over time yeah. and they figure, look, you know, maybe I'll give it to my children one way or the other. Yeah. Two huge problems. The first one is a simple processing problem. Mm-hmm. I literally just wrapped up last week the smallest estate I've ever done mm-hmm. for a widow. This was as a favor to a friend of yeah. mine whose husband died in test state, left a safety mm-hmm. deposit box. Wow. It took me eight months to get the contents of the safety deposit box into this lady's hand. She's the only survivor. He had no children. She's it. So, and she's no spring chicken. So this is eight months without her having access to her passport, to the money that's in there, to whatever. So that's, that's a simple, simple thing. Yeah. Then there are complicated estates. Then there are people who have, you know, buildings and property, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And as you know, after a certain amount, right? The government takes 40%. 40%. That's a real number. That's a real number. (laughs) Well, if you have 11 million and you're giving, you know, five to the government, that's a lot of money, Yeah. right? And that's a lot of years of your life spent hard at work trying Mm -hmm. to make it for yourself. And the reason why that happened is because You didn't spend Mm -hmm. half hour, 45 minutes, an hour of your time sitting down, planning out, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, again, this goes back to, there's a cultural fear. Oh, One is, one is, um, the first one being, you know, we don't talk about death. We do not. That's the (laughs) first part. And that's a huge part, right? The second part is, it's funny. I'll give you an example from the Dominican Republic. In the Dominican Republic, you cannot disinherit a child by mm-hmm. law. I didn't know Even that. if you've seen that child once in your life. So there's no concept of, you know, I leave everything to the dog and the heck with my children. That doesn't yeah. happen. In the U.S., you can leave everything to the dog yeah. and the heck with your children. And mm-hmm. so that's a huge cultural shift, right? Yeah. And so people then, what they do is they will, if they're smart, and, and by the way, they're smart in their own head. Then they start distributing things while they're alive. Oh, I'm going to give this kid that and that kid that, whatever. And actually dilute the estate, Mm -hmm. which doesn't really benefit anybody. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, because of that concern. Or they take the opposite, which is, look, when I die, somebody will figure it out. But when you die, that person figuring it out is the U.S. government. And they say, okay, we get paid first. Yeah. And that's a huge problem. Yeah, that's what I used to always tell my clients is that everybody in the United States has has an estate plan. It's just so you have one, whether you want to or not. It's just um, you're not in control of it. Um, the government is unless you get a you get a, an estate plan done yourself. So who do you want to be in control? The government or do you want to have some decisions like it like in advance, especially not, let's just say money aside. Um, which is a big deal in my opinion, because you think about an entrepreneur gives their whole life to that business. I mean, like the gentleman that you mentioned, you know, 18 years, seven days a week, like these, this, these aren't easy businesses. And these are, these are like, they give their life to it. And then to give a disproportionate amount to the government instead of, of the, your children or whoever, your charity, like whoever you want the money to go to, just because you didn't maybe take that time, or maybe you didn't know. But if you're watching this now, then now you know. So like, get that done because it's real and on i have horror stories for days on this which i i could talk about for hours i won't but i'm just saying that everybody has an estate plan the question is who do you want to be in control do you want to be in control of it or do you want the government to be in control of it and now add the other side of it so that's just talking about money now let's talk about like the medical side of it medical directives other things like that like who do you want to be in control of your life like maybe speak a little bit on that yeah well i'll tell you two things with respect to that The first is, if you're a good parent, you don't put your children in that situation. Mm. Um, The reason why, just talking, putting aside from getting sick, which I'll tell you a story about right now. But um, the thing is, like, when you pass on, Mm -hmm. leave your affairs in order. Because it's not your children. It's their spouses who then have a say in how things get distributed. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you have spouse of son a a dispute with wife of you know son b and now all of a sudden everybody wants whatever and this is not fair and that's not fair and so that has lasting consequences on a family 
-hmm. if you make the bad decision, but you're dead. You know what I'm saying? Like it was your choice. You yeah. spread it out as best you saw. Let people be angry at you, but yeah. you'd want your family to survive. And yeah. so don't put it on them because that's not fair to them. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. Second, as far as getting your, your business in order, your health mm -hmm. situation in order, I'm going to tell you a scary situation. July of last year, I had a client coming home from work, got hit, come getting off a bus. Man. He was in a coma for three months. He had no ID on him. Oh. His son found him because his son happens to work for uh, a hospital. And wow. he started calling every hospital to see if there was somebody meeting this description that was in there. Wow. When he finally found him, yeah. he had absolutely zero say over his father's uh, medical situation because he had no power of attorney and no authority to do anything on behalf of his father. Wow. And there was no, you know, there was no codicil that explained, you know, if X, um, if I'm in Y, X position, do Y. So the father had left no instructions for himself and he had not given his children the authority to do anything either. Yeah. And so for three months, they would go see this guy in the ICU with their hands crossed. And the only thing they could do is pray because they could not do anything. Man, That is also unfair to your children. Hmm. And so, you know, those are two very important things that you ought to consider. One, once you pass, how do you want your family to survive? Yeah. And two, if something, if God forbid something happens to you, mm -hmm. how do you want your family to deal with it? Right. Yeah. You, you want to be able to, you know, have certain rules in place or give certain people authority because, and by the way, this, this gentleman had two sons. God yeah. forbid the son that did something without authority did something wrong. Yeah. It would have been unforgivable to the other son. For right? sure. <laughs> so you don't want to put your family in that situation. Mm -hmm. And no. so... That's the lesson, Adam. Thank you for, for teasing that out. <laughs> yeah, no, I because I've seen it. And this is one of the things that it just, it hurts me. It hurts me to see this for all families, by the way. So I think every every business owner, everybody should have this plan in place, like regardless of ethnicity, where you're from, all this stuff like that makes sense. But I just see exactly what you said because of that cultural norm of not talking about death and things like that. Like, and I get it and I understand I'm part of it. Even sitting here, I'm like, oh, I don't want to talk about it. Right. But we have to like it's an important thing to talk about and in, in terms of here there's rules and there's regulations that are these in place that can make it smoother for everyone involved and at the least i mean you don't want to write that check to the government you know post-mortem essentially because they're going to get their cut either way so you at least want that like what you traded your life energy for to go to the people or organizations or charities wherever you want it to go you want it to go there in my opinion so you want to have some control so that's one that just I'm like, oh, got, got to make sure that people are educated on that one. Um, so, Martin, I'll, I'll tell you, man, it's been great learning more about your practice. It's been great learning about your, you know, your heart for the business and, and what you do and how you help your clients. So I just have to ask. So so what's next? I mean, what's next for you? What's next for the firm? Uh, for the firm, for the firm, my goal is look, we need more Latino lawyers. And my goal is to hire, groom and help develop as many of those people as possible. Mm -hmm. For my clients, I only aspire to help them have bigger problems. Yeah. As, as they walk in with one problem, my goal is be grateful, help yeah. them fix that, and send them on their way to the next bigger problem. Yeah. Um, those are the two things I aspire to. Fantastic. So if somebody's watching this uh, and they want to learn more and they want to connect with you and your team, um, I mean, what's the best way for them to do that? Restitutiolaw.com is my website. You can find, you can search Martin Restitutio on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn and Restitutio underscore law on Instagram. Fantastic. Um, well, again, Awesome having you on the show and to the audience, I'll, I will put all of the uh, all that information in the show notes. So you can just go head on over, click, you can check out the website, all the other things connect with Martin and his team. Um, and if this is your first time joining us at Mission Matters, just to let you know, we bring on entrepreneurs, executives and experts, and we have them share their mission, how they're 
giving back to the community, how they're giving back to the marketplace and really like, well, how their mission is helping the world. Like that's the point here. We want to amplify these stories. We want other people to hear them, to be inspired by them, to be educated by them. If you're into content like that, definitely hit that subscribe button. We have many more mission-based um, entrepreneurs and experts coming on and we don't want you to miss a thing. And Martine, really, it has been a pleasure and uh, just looking forward to watching your continued success. So thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Adam. I appreciate it.